Welcome, everyone. Today is a great pleasure for me to present our next SIMPAR lecture, Professor Ana Laura Pizello from University of Perugia. She is expert in building physics and energy efficient in the built environment. Professor Ana Laura, thanks for joining us today and have a good presentation. Thank you very much, Ezekiel. Thanks for your kind invitation. I would have loved to, to come to Brazil, at least to, uh, to share these thoughts together with you. So I'm going to present a short discussion. I hope to um, share with you some, um, let's say, recent findings and considerations about how to couple the big necessities we have to design and to preserve um, comfortable buildings uh, and also to with a priority in terms of environmental sustainability. So as we probably know, uh, more than half of us of the old population live uh, uh, actually in cities and this is going to be uh, even a larger uh, percentage of us in the next decades. Despite the COVID crisis um, that is compromising at the moment, uh, mostly cities environments and their well-being, this is something we'll have to face. Several studies uh, have uh, forecasted that, of course, the cities uh, consume two-thirds and are responsible for three-quarters of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time, they represent key opportunities for mitigating uh, these emissions, since at the moment they can be seen as uh, open field laboratories for climate change mitigations and hopefully a better well-being for citizens from all around the world. Unfortunately, the current condition is exacerbated by Urbanit Island, uh, the most acknowledged, the, the, let's say the best acknowledged the climate change related issue with a strong component uh, imputable to anthropogenic action. Urbanit Island is uh, that phenomenon that corresponds to a urban overheating with respect to the green belts and surroundings. And it's even worse uh, in case of uh, coupling with heat waves. And it typically corresponds with other phenomena such as the urban noise island, the increased anthropogenic pollution related to the energy emissions of our built environment, together with the mobility and so on. Here we can see some trends in, term of, in terms of maximum temperature registered during the course of the last decades that makes uh, our uh, citizens in urban uh, um, environments much vulnerable with respect to, um, let's say, local overheating and to energy poverty. They are very much related issues that increases, again, the vulnerability of urban population, representing the large majority of the whole world population, with increasing the risk for health, and increase the vulnerability in terms of indoors and outdoors comfort and well-being in general. Here we see some trends in terms of intensity of urban Thailand all around the world in several cities, and it corresponds to four, five, even 10 Celsius degrees in some, uh, let's say, uh, key conditions. But vulnerability is not linear. In particular, it affects much more people with relatively minor education level, people who spend much, much of their time at homes in vulnerable homes, affected by climate change, affected by heat waves, and with a relatively minor awareness about the effects of such phenomena on human health and how to implement eventually uh, personal mitigation strategies. These people are even more vulnerable because not only because they spend uh, most of their time at home, but also because uh, they are the least aware, especially on urban Italian, which compared to climate change, global warming and so on, uh, is a relatively minor no or um, let's say worse known phenomenon. And it's typically coupled with energy poverty. Energy poverty, which is exacerbated by the fact that this energy need that is increased, especially for cooling in uh, urban Thailand and during heat waves, um, of course, is uh, more intense 
at the peak times, for instance, during heat waves, uh, because the cost of uh, electricity at peak times is more than double than regular cost of electricity. And therefore, all these uh, said um, can show us uh, that the impact is absolutely not linear. And it's an impact on well-being, on economy in general, and in general quality of life. But the perspective is not only related to the outdoor condition in the urban environment, uh, but it's also very much related to the quality of the indoors, uh, not only for the energy need, which is increased, but also because of the compromise, let's say, quality of the life uh, within the built environment in general. In the indoors, we are used to spend almost 90% of our time. On the other side, um, let's say, and especially during the COVID crisis, this percentage further increased due to the, due to the restrictions and to, let's say, our uh, regulations that made us uh, uh, live in close proximity to our buildings and inside the buildings in most of the countries. Despite that, we know that sustainable buildings can improve our health Sustainable and conscious building design can improve not only health, but also our learning capability in case of university or school educational buildings in general, and productivity in case of office buildings and others. So it's important to improve this quality of life, this quality of the built environment, also for these multiple effects. The market showed to be aware about the importance of environmental sustainability with a clear improvement and a clear, uh, let's say, real estate upgrades uh, referred to energy efficient buildings, to comfortable buildings, to buildings uh, already integrated in green energy systems that demonstrated all around the world to, um, let's say, increase their property value by three, four, up to 10%. And this is also more clear in case of environmental certification buildings, that, um, let's say buildings characterized by environmental certification. That is, a, a, let's say, an effective way to increase the transparency of information and to reduce the information asymmetry. And of course, to reduce the asymmetry of vulnerability, as we have just discussed. And this is clear again for the market before then for the national and international standards. Indeed, the rental occupancy and pricing levels of environmental certified and environmental sustainable buildings is significantly higher than the, the value, let's say, on the market of non-certified building. This make, let's say, environmental sustainability a key uh, and urgent need, not only for the quality of life in general, but also for increasing the economic competitivity and therefore for triggering the implementation of such strategies. These are just a few uh, data already published several years ago um, that show that, for instance, environmental certified buildings uh, are um, easily, let's say, uh, rentable, are easily and uh, more, uh, let's say, highly, um, um, in, let's say, introduced within the real estate uh, market. And for instance, here we have some data regarding the possibility of lead certified building to be uptaken to the market to increase uh, the potential for rentability and, of course, to be rented um, much sooner uh, than uh, the others. So probably environmental sustainability and well-being certified, let's say, or quantified through these environmental sustainability protocols should be dealt with at the same way as traditional financial metrics, because they already shown their effect in improving the real estate values and marketability in general of the built environment, not only related to new constructions, but also related to major renovations in the built environment where most of these buildings are traditionally located. So 
So it's important to understand that it's already clear, let's say, if from several point of view, the relationship in between building occupants, humans, and the environment, what, it's, uh, um, what, it, what really needs uh, to be further investigated is uh, the relationship with all the other spheres affecting not only the humans, but also their social life. And all these dimensions may be dealt with uh, through an aware and conscious and sustainable design thinking of the built environment, not only at the single building scale, but within the framework of the human and urban dimension. These are other data demonstrating uh, what I was discussing before. So energy efficiency does not only provide, uh, let's say, um, uh, reduce the cost for energy maintenance, but aware design may improve mental function and memory possibility by 20, 25%. Uh, productivity in any work environment is absolutely improved and also the number of days uh, in terms of hospital stays is shorter in more comfortable and sustainable hospitals for, for instance. People are more productive, students are, um, let's say, pursue higher test scores and they are faster in the learning process. All these components not only characterize the environmental performance of the building, its uh, thermal behavior, its only acoustic behavior, only lighting behavior, but also um, it's a matter of all the interactions that a building or an urban environment can host. And it is also related to, um, let's say, a multidisciplinary approach that, uh, at least in my opinion, should be taken into account. There are several uh, very important findings by medical doctors and psychiatric scientists. Uh, and for instance, the tri theory of intelligence by Professor Stenberg uh, defines intelligence um, in terms of its uh, three, um, basically, uh, three parts, the componential part, the experiential part and the practical parts. Defining intelligence as how well an individual deals with environmental changes throughout uh, their lifespan. So all these environmental factors, the real world environment that are relevant for each one's life are uh, a matter, let's say, of architects, building engineers, and all the other players, including the real estate market that already showed how these, uh, uh, let's say, theories uh, take a key place already in the market. Despite that, um, let's say, despite the necessary uh, evidence uh, of the importance of several spheres and their effect in uh, people's well-being in the built environment in general, there is a big lack in terms of models, tools for quantification and for designers, and national and international standards dealing with the whole indoor environmental quality and outdoor environmental quality. Typically, guide guidelines all around the world cover single domains. What does it mean? They cover the thermal sphere, the thermal sphere first of all. Maybe they are the best defined uh, from, a, let's say, a multi-domain point of view. The thermal sphere itself is affected, as we can see here in the picture, by the thermal comfort, which is, again, affected by air temperature, radiant temperature, the metabolic rate, um, airspeed, relative humidity, and so on. But this is still not enough because our thermal perception per se is uh, affected as demonstrated to be affected not only by these thermal related variables it's affected by the color of the light the possibility to see outside and to enjoy the natural panorama or um, to the noise environment or to the soundscape so to all the human spheres in terms of experiences context social activities and attitudes that should be taken into account through implement through the implementation first uh, the theorization but also the implementation of a more holistic human centric uh, view uh, for designing both the indoors and the outdoor spaces so these uh, human centric perspective uh, let's say that establishes a kind of link in between the indoors and outdoors to be part of the same let's say design issue 
cities themselves, it's true that they represent the most vulnerable, um, let's say, places, as I mentioned. But at the same time, um, they are even uh, the, the, the most ready, let's say, territories for implementation of uh, strategies for an adaptation and mitigations. That's the reason why uh, they are probably the most ready territories where uh, we can, uh, let's say, somehow experiment our proposals. Bloomberg Green and City Lab propose a more, let's say, a better people-centric solution for the cities that need to be and that need to be reconfigured, like in the case of the 15-minute cities. While others uh, look at the 15-minute cities as, um, as a, let's say, a schema, a non-equal schema, uh, because of course it's uh, uh, it makes some uh, difference in between uh, people living inside the specific centers uh, with respect to the people living in the suburbs. That's why uh, a more, uh, let's say, inclusive city needs to be extended in terms of public transportation availability. Streamline, what does it mean? Most of the emissions, not, um, let's say, are not only related uh, to the transportation, while we are, uh, let's say, that we are uh, typically brought to think about. They are mostly related to the emission in terms of heat and air pollution of the energy systems. So for achieving that indoor and exacerbating the outdoor thermal comfort and all the other domains. That's why we have to implement, let's say, protection actions like the one that you can see here uh, in terms of uh, the MOSE for urban flooding protect that are typically affecting, unfortunately, the city of Venice in Italy. So um, healthy buildings uh, probably represent a kind of paradigm uh, and healthy cities uh, is, uh, takes part to the same paradigm where we spend 90% of the time indoors. And if we think about the time that we spend in indoors and in the outdoors of the urban environment, basically we reach almost the total time that we are typically facing. And, uh, of course, um, this, uh, this can influence, let's say, indoor, in, indoors of the building for residential uses, but not only, especially because at least the buildings hosting offices and other working activity um, as they have demonstrated to um, hugely impact uh, the quality of life, uh, the productivity, and therefore they are potentially responsible for an important, let's say, investment enhancement, not only related to the observation that we can make at the real estate level, but also because the productivity of the worker increasing, the productivity of workers by, for instance, 10, 11, 12 percent um, can result in an important investment let's say, return. And this is, uh, let's say, relatively easy uh, to be achieved with improved ventilation. While, for instance, a better lighting uh, will produce uh, uh, up to 20, 30 percent of energy efficiency and therefore almost linear, uh, let's say, decrease in terms of uh, air pollutant emissions. And that's important from a both local and urban and even larger scale. Some paradigms, uh, some paradigms uh, about, uh, implement, let's say, uh, concerning uh, the implementation in the built environment um, should not be only focused on the energy saving and that's it. We all know that uh, materials and ventilation re may represent hazardous substances. So it's important to be focused also on the selection of materials and the proper air quality in the post-COVID cities, uh, mostly, let's say. The access to daylight is another important way to save energy for lighting, but also for improving in general well-being of buildings uh, inhabitants. And access to nature, even if it's not easy to be quantified in terms of energy saving, it's important uh, in terms uh, of uh, increasing the productivity, the social life, and in general, the well-being of the built environment, even um, the feeling that are produced um, uh, by, by the access of nature can calm well-being of everybody in residential um, spaces. 
So the idea is to acknowledge and to start really uh, thinking about how to acknowledge and to quantify the different, the different spheres affecting the holistic well-being of humans living in the built environment in both the indoors and the outdoors, especially in urban center. Because so far we were much focused on the environmental and physical condition, but uh, we acknowledge that the social cultural implication and psycho-spiritual uh, dimensions are at the same time important and mutually affected. This, is, uh, this can be only, let's say, dealt with uh, through a human-centric view in order to rethink and to reinterpret uh, models for building uh, indoors and outdoors um, design and, uh, uh, let's say, improvement. So, as I mentioned, mitigation and adaptation uh, strategies should be tailored um, on the human's behavior, human's attitudes, and simply on humans. Typically, we are um, used to propose mitigation strategies that are based on physical models, again, for sure, super effective uh, from uh, some point of view, super narrow and uh, um, let's say useful for uh, handling one issue at a time. But these issues are necessarily related. That's why probably a more holistic but also quantitative models uh, and uh, let's say practical tools uh, for designers, policy makers and urban planners should be agreed and provided at several dimensions. Therefore, the classic, let's say, boundary between the indoors and outdoors probably is mixed up if we acknowledge or if we share this opinion about the necessity of human centric approach. These uh, implies that health and safety risk mitigation, of course, includes application in indoors and outdoors, and maybe they are parts of the same, uh, let's say, necessity that we can face. Focus on the indoors, as I was mentioned, um, most of the mitigation strategies are argued and demonstrated by means of several techniques. They are typically remote sensing techniques, that of course depends on the availability of satellite information, the trajectories that, that the satellites pursue, the resolution and the timing. And of course, uh, this uh, makes a big, uh, let's say, lag in between uh, cities and cities, in between uh, several territories. Uh, and it typically doesn't really meet uh, the necessity of energy poor people. Another way is to analyze the quality of the urban environment through networks of weather stations. Weather stations are typically limited in terms of number and in terms of position. And most of them, at least the most reliable one and the most controlled one by our, uh, let's say, uh, standard organisms and, uh, um, let's say, public authorities, are located outside the urban areas, close to the airports. And typically, they are not representative of the concrete jungle that you can see here in New York City in the picture. And the third way is uh, the third way of uh, characterizing, let's say, dense and polluted urban areas uh, is uh, meant with the mobile transits. So those techniques, which are absolutely non-continuous uh, in terms of time because they are periodical, but they can go through the urban texture that at least it's something uh, more equal and more granular in terms of the necessity we have to face to reach the humans inside the urban, the urban texture. That's why we typically have proposed and applied uh, to, let's say, equip citizens with uh, sensors, so realistically, let's say, with uh, miniaturized portable systems, uh, even wearable systems, in order to see the citizens in an approach of citizen science as vectors of information and targets targets in terms of cities, uh, citizens' well-being, but also vector of information in a, um, let's say, data-driven, bottom-up approach that we would like to implement in all the urban environment in a relatively cost-effective way. Here we can see some uh, 
let's say, information about the campaigns uh, we are performing in several cities. We started with uh, Italian heritage cities because uh, most of these uh, climate change related hazards um, in terms of, uh, for instance, urban local overheating is also affecting um, environmental resilience and citizens' resilience of these urban centers that are typically characterized by tourism fluxes. And tourism fluxes per se represents, um, let's say, the key income of the of such, uh, let's say, urban context in Italy or in any other countries with uh, historical architecture. And you can see here immediately from the picture that if you monitor the conditions here, even if it's in close proximity to the urban center, you cannot really expect to have a reliable weather condition or microclimate condition that you are able to get if you monitor inside the urban environment, which is specifically characterized by a very granular and microclimate scale pecu peculiarity. That's why we literally were our uh, stations in order to map the key environmental parameters basically affecting our well-being in terms of our temperature, relative humidity, solar radiation in terms uh, and uh, let's say illuminance uh, and also air quality. So the idea is to use uh, these granular data in order to identify the most critical areas and to develop, let's say, um, tourism resilience and um, tourism resiliency planning and risk planning in order to better inform those, uh, those uh, groups of population that we, that we identified at the beginning of the discussion as the most vulnerable popul population. And probably the cultural heritage sites, as I mentioned, are also affect not only because the urban overheating affect the well-being of citizens themselves, but also because most of the economic activity is related to the livability of these environments. Here we see, for instance, some uh, uh, measurements taken with a drone in the Knossos Palace in Greece that is uh, mostly affected by overheating that can compromise the visitability from tourists during the most, uh, let's say, popular um, tourism periods in summer. And the same is in Rome, where water bodies, uh, architectural heritage water bodies are basically seen as a mitigation strategies because located in critical areas. So the maps like these uh, that are collected in a city close to Perugia here in central Italy in between Rome and Florence, just to give you an idea of, uh, of the position, can allow us to describe which is the highest heat um, let's say uh, the highest um, risk, the highest uh, um, risky and vulnerable territory. By chance or not by chance, uh, these cities, uh, this the street, uh, let's say, uh, to accede uh, to the historical and tourism area is the, the, the most affected by urban heat because it's the best uh, irradiated and so is the worst uh, to be walked to accede to the tourism area, especially in summer, where the city basically lives thanks to the tourism. And this is also producing and this is responsible for the movement of all the commercial activities from this street to the other more narrow street, literally, let's say, um, less uh, reachable from the tourists, but at the same time better shaded and therefore maybe uh, better seen and more pleasantly seen and lived during the course of summer. So these measurements that are simple measurements of their temperature while walking can demonstrate and can predict uh, the performance of commercial activity. So they are relatively, let's say, um, they are, they may have an important role in forecasting the commercial performance or, uh, let's say, the tourism paths during the course of specific times during, uh, let's say, in various uh, um, seasons. 
the idea is a human-centric uh, total environment investigation. And thanks to this kind of wearable system techniques uh, uh, that allowed us to be much precise in defining microclimate conditions really affecting humans, tourists, cities, and also city and also buildings facing uh, this granular condition, we can calibrate and validate microclimate models. My, microclimate models can be run also according to future weather and climate change scenarios in terms of predictive scenarios by the intergovernmental panel of climate change. Here we can see some results, for instance, in terms of air temperature and relative humidity, typically showing the increase of air temperature estimated according to the scenario of the fourth assessment report um, uh, included in these models that we published some years ago. In particular, this is uh, the most important square of this, cities of this uh, medieval city located close to Perugia. And we see that we can forecast, according to the model, we can forecast an increase in terms of air temperature up to 3-4 Celsius degrees which will for sure compromise livability and tourist ability of these kind of areas. Imagine that this square is basically this one, the most important square named Piazza Grande indeed, uh, of this city that is one of the most appealing medieval city in Italy, that is basing the whole economy, at least on the, uh, let's say, historical city center on tourism fluxes. So the idea is to couple microclimate monitoring, human-centric monitor monitoring that are really representative of uh, the human conditions within the urban environment with microclimate models that can be able to, um, let's say, support decision making and risk assessment, especially due to the forcing related to climate change. These models can be also useful for being integrated to uh, structural resilience models in order to detect at the same time people will be, but also buildings will be, especially in the case of cultural heritage, because most of the buildings affected by environmental forcing are those buildings which uh, have also to preserve their architectural and identity value. So uh, this principle, let's say, is also pursued in our city. Here we see Perugia and in particular the historical city center here, the suburbs, uh, urban and uh, let's say relatively modern architectural suburbs and the green belts where luckily our campus is located. So these uh, MBWare, so let's say the environmental and wearable sensing techniques, can also allow to do a kind of uh, automatic data analysis. Through a data-driven approach, therefore a bottom-up approach, we can even identify, not only through the support of GPS, but we can only identify we can, sorry, we can even identify the microclimate characteristics of the cities because, of course, it's very much related to the configuration, to the materials, to the configuration of the urban systems, to the materials characterizing building skins, pavements, surfaces, uh, and the solar trapping in general. That, of course, is much more evident in here where you can see uh, a classic, let's say, ancient cities. Um, city like Perugia um, or any other ancient city that you can have in mind in Europe and of course in Brazil and in other countries. And here you see the important difference in between what's happening in terms of thermal behavior in the urban historic, is historical area compared to the urban, let's say, modern area and the suburban green belt, which is characterized by a more pleasant, let's say, temperature in the mid-season, but on the other side is more, um, let's say, it's characterized by a relatively higher solar radiation due to the minor shading systems in, in summer conditions. This identification allows us uh, to produce a kind of data clustering in order to analyze which is uh, uh, the um, 
thermal and microclimate performance of uh, urban canyons, urban squares, and other, uh, let's say, spots that are typically lived by um, tourists or, um, let's say, sport activities, students and others. So uh, only with this kind of uh, spatial and uh, temporal granularity, we can really, let's say, increase the reliability of our risk and resilience models for a better livability of the urban environment. As mentioned, the only thermal or radiative sphere is not enough to identify uh, people, uh, let's say, well-being and their comfort and livability. That's why on top of the slide, we can see a classic path in a very, uh, let's say, dense urban area located in Rome, uh, Italian capital, of course. And here in this experiment, we were focused on air quality and not only on the thermal aspect. And we see that, uh, let's say, most of the air pollution is uh, exactly located at the street lights, at the, at the cross, um, let's say, in between uh, two high traffic uh, let's say, ways. And that's important to identify because if we allow tourists or citizens to walk through a condition like this, especially uh, walking and not even biking, they are usually, they are used to spend in, in these uh, absolutely polluted, uh, let's say, spots, um, some minutes every day. And this is uh, um, linearly, let's say, correlated to their risk to, um, let's say, uh, to uh, face with the health issues related to the, the respiratory apparatus. So all these consideration may be also drivers for estimating and for forecasting and hopefully mitigating, um, let's say, the risk, health risk related to urban air pollution. On the other side, let's say on the positive side of the medal, we can see the effect of the mitigation strategies that are actually, um, let's say, put in field and implemented uh, in uh, urban parks. Here we see some other results that we collected with a mobile stroller with a kind of microclimate station equipped in it, where we are able to measure all the parameters um, to, in order that are useful for us to calculate the heat index that we um, that is affected, of course, how we're well being in the urban environment, and we see when, how and when, how much, let's say, and where the um, parks can influence, positively affect, let's say, the microclimate conditions. But itself, the only park design is not enough to improve the urban environmental qualities for cities and, um, let's say, for citizens and tourism, because only coupling the architectural layout of the surrounding together with the parks, with all the other mitigation strategies, we can really enhance the effect, the mitigation effect of such solutions that for sure represent effective, let's say, for solutions for optimizing the urban environmental quality. But of course, it has to be, again, an holistic perspective, because very simply, let's say, here, this is an experiment um, carried out in Manhattan, in New York City, where you can imagine all the skyscrapers that are typically designed. If you um, design and construct a row of skyscrapers in front of a park, you, um, let's say, automatically, let's say, um, minimize the effect, the mitigation effect of the park immediately after that line of buildings, that neighborhood, that blocks. The same strategies may be implemented while biking. The biking, and in particular, the chances offered by all the bike sharing systems that are currently implemented in all the major cities around the world are, let's say, basically uh, untangible because those bikes may be the perfect ways and the perfect medium to equip with all these microclimate sensors. The bike itself allows to pursue the necessary granularity and the necessary, let's say, space span that we need in order to characterize at the same time, or let's say with varying 10 to 15 minutes, a distance that can cover one, two, three kilometers. 
And this is important, and uh, uh, this is important to estimate not only the effect, for instance, of mitigation strategy, but also the effect of uh, a specific urban configuration. Here, this is an experiment carried out two summers ago, always in New York City, where we are used to implement most of these experiments, also thanks to the data availability that this territory typically has. And we can see the important, let's say, temperature difference that is up to two, three Celsius degrees, more or less at the, at the same time uh, while simply biking. These kind of experiments may represent, a, um, let's say, a useful input for a large scale implementation at city level, at least for data collection, but for sure also to represent a nice and, let's say, operative basis for training resilience models and forecasting models. Other ways, uh, always, uh, let's say, affecting urban resilience and in general urban livability are those small parts, typically defined as pocket parts or interim parts, that are parts located, occupying, let's say, probably one block, two blocks maximum, um, with the specific architectural strategies such as shading, vegetation, water bodies, and some furniture inside them that want to foster social activities. In these parts that represent close proximity parks, much important during the, the COVID, let's say, conditions where we were forced, when we were forced to live and to spend all our time in close proximity to our buildings, um, can, let's say, improve our multi-domain comfort perception. So they can host social activities, they can represent, let's say, some uh, um, almost private garden condition, and uh, according to our experiments, they basically showed an important, um, let's say, livable spot, uh, thanks to the permeable uh, spaces that, that they were able to, let's say, reproduce. Despite that, uh, despite the positive perception from a, an acoustic, thermal and quality and uh, lighting point of view, despite that, uh, per se, the pocket parks are not able to really mitigate urban overheating. Because uh, while asking to the tourists and to the citizens about their multi-domain comfort perception, of course, we were at the same time monitoring all these parameters, the physical parameters. So we see the physical parameters, which are basically not affected by these uh, small spots, but the, let's say, um, psychological and sociological feelings that were affected by all these parameters. So. Of course, I, I cannot really say if they are uh, positive solutions or not, but for sure they represent some small spot occasions in order to leave the outdoors and to improve in general quality of life in dense urban environments. Then on a relatively larger scale, the same techniques may be applied while driving. This is a van that we are used to use uh, uh, in our cities, especially in Italy, also for, uh, let's say, the limitation in, uh, in traveling that we had to face during the course of the uh, last two years, basically. Um, but thanks to the, uh, the size of the van, of course, we were, able, we were able to implement a variety of sensors, also characterizing the direction of uh, air pollution, emissions, uh, light, in terms of illuminance and the thermal and the solar uh, radiation. And this is important to analyze because um, equipment like this may be useful for quantifying anthropogenic emissions in terms of air pollution sources, heat sources, that can be, is not a, a solution to be, let's say, um, to substitute uh, the others, but of course it gives a different perspective uh, with respect to wearable sensing techniques because equipment like this as you can see here in the picture and in particular in these and in these graphs are not only able to map all the parameters that we want but are also able to cover larger distance and to analyze the direction of the sources in terms of illuminance for instance with uh, the possible identification of lighting noise light pollution let's say or the solar radiation 
with the access of solar radiation that we may face in narrow streets, in urban canyons, or in square and so on, directly affecting our well-being in the urban environment, as we saw in the previous experiment. So a kind of combination and equipment of this solution over public transportation, again, may support the reliability of uh, forecasting models for a better risk forecasting in case, for instance, of heat waves or water bumps. So all, so all these solution that takes part, let's say, to our idea of envyware, to something that is able to detect environmental condition, but is also portable, of course, um, let's say, needs to be coupled to something that is easy to visualize for a large public. The same large public, which needs, which needs to be, let's say, made more aware about all the conditions that we see at the beginning of uh, the discussion that uh, were not enough known by vulnerable population and vulnerable groups of population living in urban areas and spending 90% of their time in the built environment. That's why, let's say, of course, we propose some application of these uh, solutions uh, with respect to automatic data analysis and bottom-up approach, identifying immediately air quality condition, immediately heat risk conditions. We imagine, let's say, a future where uh, any tourists or any citizens all the time that has, have to go to uh, the office or to bring uh, children uh, to school and so on, not only is interested in how much time do they spend to reach the target, the target location, but also how much, um, um, let's say, how much this uh, path is affected by air quality compromising or is affected by air pollution sources. And for instance, we may select the path that is uh, most probably the fastest or as fast as the other one, but the least polluted one. We should be aware about this information in order to minimize our health risk. <clears throat> this kind of, uh, um, let's say, bottom-up approach and data cluster analysis allow us to immediately, let's say, identify uh, the effect of mitigation strategies. Here, there are some other experiments carried out in the same urban environments while identifying which are the key physical triggers um, or the key physical, let's say, identification parameters for driving um, our risk assessment. In particular, CO2 concentration is a key driver for air quality. Uh, the apparent temperature is a key driver for identifying the thermal perception. And also solar radiation is a key trigger. So most probably by only monitoring a few parameters like those ones, we can be more resilient to climate change in the urban environment without compromising our lifestyle in case we, can, we, we don't want to change it. And here we have uh, some uh, similar analysis about always data-driven techniques applied in uh, several, let's say, architectural contexts. In the modern context, the same, uh, let's say, procedure works uh, also if applied to the historical context. Uh, here we have New York City, here we have uh, Perugia, so completely different environment. But still, the urban canopy models, so those models who are used to, which are used to uh, identify the urban um, thermal behavior and so uh, that can allow us to identify heat stress and heat related risks, uh, typically neglect humans inside them. That's why we were focused, thanks to the cooperation with the Princeton University, we were focused uh, on the inclusion, let's say, and the consideration of humans and greenery within urban canopies, and in particular in urban canyons, in order to start coupling those models aimed at uh, the interpretation, let's say, of the urban canopy layout with the other models aimed at a better interpretation of the human behavior inside uh, the urban layout. 
So the idea is to uh, start a radically different, um, let's say, short term risk forecasting after mapping all the key parameters through a bottom up approach that can support cities resiliency planning, that can support a better and more tailored design of urban mitigation strategies, especially facing urban islands that can be also better for predicting building energy use that, uh, as uh, um, we observed at the beginning of the discussion, is the major uh, responsible for air pollution emission. So the work in progress is, uh, let's say, the integration of all these variety of monitoring techniques and data collection and analysis tools that all together can face, let's say, the smart city challenges, especially in the post-COVID areas. While, as we discussed, the real estate market is already, uh, let's say, implementing those strategies uh, which valorize in the market environmental sustainability and uh, health, let's say, conditions in the built environment. A nice opportunity may be given by energy community. So let's say a kind of interbuilding uh, scale of the built environment, which is not already the large urban scale, but it's not only the single built, the single building scale. The energy community may support the design at a relatively uh, larger scale than the single building. So it may support the design of high efficiency, healthy and environmentally sustainable buildings within their microclimates, so, so with the chance to mitigate the surroundings affecting building energy uh, efficiency, but also, um, let's say, comfort conditions in that kind of boundary that we showed. It's a kind of uh, uh, integrated boundary in between the indoors and outdoors. And here I put some reference about a collaborative European project named the Zero Plus that was specifically aimed at supporting the design tools of zero energy communities. Focus now on the indoors. So while, let's say, from the urban to the indoor building scale through the energy community interbuilding scale, the idea is that even in the indoors, we cannot really face on one domain at a time because our perception is radically influenced by a multi-domain approach in general. And this is important, why? Because uh, basically, again, in the indoors, we have the same need to define tools and experimental, uh, let's say, strategies that can valorize this multi-domain approach. We are co coordinating an effort collecting almost 200 test rooms able to perform all the domain's triggers in terms of air temperature, velocity, but also air quality, illuminance, acoustics and sound, um, let's say, escaping uh, triggers in order to better, um, let's say, to perform a better interpretation of uh, human perception with related to the environmental condition. Here we see some uh, graphs representing the huge interest in terms of increased publication number during the course of the last decades, and in particular, some facilities where we are used to perform not only physical, but also physiological signal analysis in order to have a better personal information, a better analysis of the physiological and psychological condition, and where we can see those uh, human-centered parameters affecting a thermal perception, for instance. Uh, we found out, uh, li let's say, statistically significant correlation in between um, the attitude of a person, um, of a smoker, with respect to a non-smoking person, uh, with the attitude of a person uh, uh, in terms of place of origin with respect uh, to uh, its uh, acoustic comfort condition. Or at the same time, we found out uh, through uh, an electroencephalogram analysis, the correlation in between specific triggers and the, um, let's say, um, neural activity. Uh, so um, let's say in order to better identify when a physical parameter start affecting human perception. And that's why uh, we start designing uh, places like this when we can integrate uh, triggers and perception. 
And in particular here, we see very briefly the final results. So let's say uh, here we see the thermal sensation vote with respect to acoustic sensation vote. So basically we see that in cold conditions where the subjects, the experimented subjects are exposed to cold um, thermal condition, in general, they have a kind of confusion in the interpretation of acoustic sensation vote and the vice versa. What does it mean? Uh, if I want to save energy, most probably I can uh, implement in buildings some soundscape that can uh, give uh, building occupants the perception of a better thermal feeling in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, warm condition in the winter or relatively cold condition in the summer. And the same uh, happens, let's say, in case of an acoustic, uh, um, let's say, low quality environment with, um, let's say, boring noise that basically affect our uh, capability to identify air quality conditions. So, of course, all the spheres are mutually affected and all these models cannot really uh, be representative of human perception and therefore human attitudes in terms of comfort, uh, let's say, votes and energy use without coupling all this information. That's why we also use virtual reality in order to identify which is uh, um, the, the best, let's say, architectural trigger that can drive design. Or, for instance, uh, the correlation in between the color of the light in terms of, um, let's say, temperature color of the light system and the thermal environment. Imagine uh, an office building that in, in winter, instead of uh, uh, allowing us uh, to switch on and off or to regulate the thermostat that is typically responsible for uh, up to 10% of the energy waste just while modifying one or two Celsius degrees in terms of temperature target, imagine that we can have a more warm feeling in case of uh, more yellowish um, lighting. So automatically we can adapt the color temperature of the light in order to drive our thermal comfort perception like for instance in winter to, toward a more warm condition or a more warm perception in this case. So the idea is again according to the both indoors and outdoor assumption to have a holistic view including of course air quality, of course a thermal um, environment, of course the lighting, the noise, but also other non-physical or let's say relatively less easy to be measured aspects like the architectural look, like the presence of ve vegetation, like the architectural layout that can foster social activity or like the, asset, the access to the nature or to the daylight and so on. So while concluding very, let's say, briefly, the, the idea of uh, this discussion was to um, deliver a kind of message, not to be only focused on the specific physical triggers that happen in, the, in a specific indoors and outdoor environments, because they are all part of the same vision of human well-being. So they cannot re really be dealt with only with a one domain at a time approach, not only with the only engineering approach, uh, but of course, uh, in order to achieve a better well-being performance and a bad, better energy saving and in general environmental uh, sustainability uh, exploitation of resorts, of course, we, at least in our opinion, need to combine all our awarenesses and knowledge in order to develop exhaustive and multidisciplinary practical tools for data collection and risk assessment as much as we can and as fast as we can. So thank you very much for your time. I'm open to any questions. Let's see, I cannot hear you. 
Oh, now it's okay. I yeah. was uh, thanks for your presentation. Again, it was a, a great lecture. Always teach us how to manage the sustainable uh, things. Uh, we have some questions for you. Uh, the first one came from Sao Paulo. Maybe someone that uh, watched uh, other lecture from you. <laughs> from Kelly Almeida. About indoor environments, how do you believe people will deal with the insecurity uh, of staying indoor for a long time after the pandemic in terms of air quality and thermal comfort? Do you think regulations concerning air renovation or natural ventilation should be widely implemented? Yeah, thanks, Kellen, for the question. Um, yeah, I do believe the, the most impacted sector in the, um, let's say, environmental management for the indoors will be uh, natural ventilation. In general, um, at least in Italy, let's say, uh, or at least with our students, probably, air quality was always, let's say, um, consider, let's say, at a um, second stage compared to the other climate control. Um, not only due to the, um, the, the, the air quality uh, correlation with the virus, uh, in general, I do believe that this is going to be a necessity that will radically change our behavior in terms of uh, uh, building energy management. And also because a non-aware natural ventilation use or an unconscious mechanical ventilation use may increase a lot the energy need in the buildings. So, so we have to, at least in my opinion, it's an urgent need that we need to face in order to radically and urgently adapt uh, to the, these new necessities. So I, I strongly believe this is a step one to be faced, uh, first with our students probably, uh, but in general with the local standards and national standards. Very well. Let's go to the question number two. Uh, in tropical regions like Brazil Northeast, uh, that in the majority of time it presents temperature over 35 uh, Celsius degree, with some improvements, the temperature reduction can be uh, two or three Celsius degrees less. Do you have any minimal intervention area for we have and temperature decrease? Yeah, um, let's say from some point of view, uh, we envy you about uh, we envy you a bit, let's say, <laughs> because we have these temperatures only, let's say, two weeks in summer. Um, but yes, in general, the, the message, at least in my opinion here, is that the mitigations in general techniques uh, cannot be faced uh, with only thinking about a water body design or a urban park design, because all the solutions need to be really considered at a large scale urban planning level. So we can include uh, uh, as many parks uh, you, you want. From a global climate point of view, probably they are effective. They, they are effective. But if they are not coupled with uh, urban planning design that is, uh, let's say, that is able to optimize their effect on a long distance basis, then only a few, uh, only a few buildings can uh, take advantage of this. Typically, two, three Celsius degrees is something that is uh, reasonable to be achieved with mitigation strategies at, on a larger scale. You see, in tropical climates, one of the most important results were achieved in Singapore. That most probably uh, it's even more tropical than your climate. Let's explore here, maybe in the future. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. Uh, the United Nations in the guideline for sustainability highlights that economies can be the basis for sustainability. In countries with strong economies, the individual economic power can be third times more than in the less economic, less developed economies, for instance. To balance that, maybe a key for sustainability uh, can be the economic power. Uh, how countries with less developed economic economies can work for fit with human comfort and environmental sustainability? And what is the university holding in this contest? 
Ah, that's a that's a tough Good job. <laughs> that's a tough job for me to reply. Um, let's say that this is a, a larger issue, um, but in general, um, let's say that um, most pro the only vision that I can bring uh, to the table here is that uh, developed countries have uh, typically stronger ties at the moment. Uh, so it's true that uh, uh, underdevelopment countries um, have a relatively minor economic power to implement these strategies, but for sure they have a relatively, let's say, lighter ties to respect. Here, I showed you several pictures about New York City, that for sure is not an underdevelopment country and, uh, and city. Um, but at the same time, uh, you see that uh, the, let's say, in order to develop a, and to implement a pocket park, which is one block park, there is a huge economic investment out of it. Now they are selling the sky above the skyscrapers just to you know to, so to decide to implement a, a pocket park like this uh, mobilizes a huge investment so what i can say what i can consider here is that that kind of tie is of course let's say not easy uh, to be uh, to be released or to be crossed so probably uh, those countries uh, which have uh, uh, larger, let's say, potentials for improvement uh, can start facing these issues now that they know what's the consequence of not taking into account these conditions. Other challenge to us. No? So uh, thank you for, for your lecture again. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us, your achievements. Um, a great to, to you and your team. Uh, you. I would like also to to say thank you to the audience for watching us today, and invited everyone for for be here again uh, from third to five of June in the Simpa conference. Ciao, Laura. Grazie. Ciao, ciao. Grazie a tutti. Tutto to you ciao, soon. Ciao. Thank you.